The Exploratorium presents Voting Paradoxes. Suppose there's a person who needs to make a decision between two options, chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream. They're free to choose either, but let's suppose they select chocolate. They declare a preference for chocolate, and they receive it. This is what it looks like when an individual makes a decision. Now let's suppose we have a group of people making the same decision. Some of them will prefer chocolate, others will prefer vanilla. But what if the members of this group do not get to choose individually? Rather, let's imagine they must come to a group decision, selecting a single flavor which they will all share. Given their competing desires, how can they come to a fair compromise? A typical approach is to put it to a vote. In a majority rule vote, each person declares their preferred ice cream flavor. The votes for each flavor are counted up, and the flavor with the most votes is the group's choice. In this group, there are five votes for chocolate and only four votes for vanilla. Chocolate, therefore, is a better choice for this group since it leads to a higher level of overall group satisfaction. This is what it looks like when a group makes a decision. And as long as there are only two flavors to choose from, this type of voting is guaranteed to satisfy a majority of the voters. But if there are more than two options, things get complicated. Let's go back to the individual voter. By asking for chocolate, they are revealing that they prefer chocolate to vanilla. That is, they have an internal ranking which places chocolate above vanilla. Now, imagine that before they receive their ice cream, a third flavor, strawberry, is added, and this person is given the opportunity to choose again. How will they decide? In order to make a choice, they must figure out where strawberry goes in their overall ranking. There are three possibilities. Strawberry might go at the top of their ranking, in which case they will change their request to strawberry. Strawberry could go in the middle, in which case they'd want to stick with chocolate. Or strawberry could go at the bottom, in which case they'd really want to stick with chocolate. Notice that there doesn't seem to be any rational basis for this person to decide they want vanilla at this point. Now let's go back to the group, who would voted like this. How will they react to the presence of strawberry? Obviously, this could play out a number of ways, but here's one possibility. Suppose the vanilla voters all agree that strawberry is the least appealing flavor. They place it at the bottom of their ranking and stick with their vanilla votes. Then suppose that most of the chocolate voters agree that strawberry is the worst flavor and decide to stick with chocolate. Finally, let's suppose that a couple of the chocolate voters were actually secret strawberry lovers. They put it at the top of their ranking and switched their votes to strawberry. When we add up the votes, we find that vanilla, with four votes, is now the winner. So the group has done something we would never expect an individual to do. That is, this group, which would have gone with chocolate, has reacted to the presence of a third option by ignoring that option and apparently changing its mind about its original choice. Not only does this seem a little irrational, it's actually an objectively bad outcome. If we review the underlying preferences of the chocolate voters and the strawberry voters, we see that all of them would rather be eating chocolate than vanilla. That is, if the group switched to chocolate, a majority would become happier than they are now. This is known as the spoiler effect. By entering the race, strawberry has spoiled the election, causing it to settle on a less than optimal flavor. In order to achieve a better outcome, this group needs to switch to a better voting method. Under a ranked voting system, voters don't just declare their top choice, they report their full ranking of the flavors from best down to worst. We take a vote like this to imply three things. First of all, in a choice between chocolate and vanilla, this voter prefers chocolate. In a choice between vanilla and strawberry, this voter prefers vanilla. And finally, in a choice between chocolate and strawberry, this voter prefers chocolate. So this ranked vote can be broken down into three preferences about pairs of flavors. So let's bring in our voters from the spoiled election and allow them to vote their full ranked preferences. How should we tally these votes? One way is to consider pairs of flavors one at a time. For instance, a majority of the voters prefer chocolate to vanilla, so we should consider this to be the group's ranking for those flavors as well. Similarly, a majority prefer vanilla to strawberry, and finally, a majority prefer chocolate to strawberry. There's only one way to reassemble these three preferences into an overall group ranking from best to worst. Notice that chocolate now appears at the top of that list. By using this form of ranked voting, the group has succeeded at choosing the most satisfying flavor. But while ranked voting gets us out of the spoiler effect, it can lead to another, arguably worse, problem. Suppose we hold another election to choose an ice cream flavor using ranked voting. This time, five people vote for vanilla first, then chocolate, then strawberry. Four people vote for strawberry first, then vanilla, then chocolate. And finally, three people vote for chocolate, then strawberry, then vanilla. So which flavor is this group's favorite? We know that it can't be chocolate because a majority of these voters prefer vanilla to chocolate. 
But we also know it can't be vanilla, because a majority of these voters prefer strawberry to vanilla. However, it can't be strawberry either, because a majority prefer chocolate to strawberry. No matter which flavor we choose, we can always find a majority of the group that would be happier if we switched to something else. This group does not appear to have a top choice. To understand what's going wrong, consider that when we compare three flavors, two at a time, there are eight possible ways for this to turn out. But there are only six ways of arranging three flavors from best to worst. Six of the pairwise comparisons are related to the six full rankings, but the two leftover possibilities cannot be formed into a clear hierarchy. Rather, they seem to form cycles. While each person casts a ranked vote from best to worst, the group as a whole can end up with a cyclic set of preferences. The whole point of having an election was to force the group to make some choice about an ice cream flavor. In its inability to identify a clear winner, ranked voting has failed at its primary task. In order to come to a decision, these voters need another method for counting up their votes, one which is tough enough to always settle on a flavor. So let's go back to the drawing board and consider something we'll call elimination voting. Under this system, we count up the top choices in the collection of ranked votes and determine which flavor got the fewest votes. This turns out to be chocolate, with only three. We then eliminate chocolate from the running. This frees up some votes, which get reassigned based on their secondary preferences. We now count up the top votes again and find that strawberry has the clear majority, with seven votes. Elimination voting doesn't suffer from the spoiler effect, and it always picks a winner. But once again, while our new voting method solves some of our problems, it comes with some new, even weirder problems of its own. Suppose we hold another election to choose a flavor using elimination voting. Two people vote for strawberry first, then chocolate, then vanilla. Another four people also like strawberry best, but otherwise prefer vanilla to chocolate. Another five like vanilla, then chocolate, then strawberry. And finally, six voters choose chocolate first, then strawberry, then vanilla. If we apply elimination voting, we see that chocolate and strawberry each receive six top place votes, while vanilla only receives five. So vanilla gets eliminated, and after the votes get reassigned, we see that chocolate beats strawberry 11 to 6. Under elimination voting, this group seems to strongly prefer chocolate. But before they receive their ice cream, let's make the following change. If this group chooses chocolate, the voters will not only receive ice cream, they will each get a handful of gold coins as well. This deal only applies to chocolate, not vanilla or strawberry. In response to this, two of the voters decide that maybe chocolate is their favorite flavor after all and move it to the top of their ballot. Remember that this group was already going to choose chocolate, and chocolate has only gotten more appealing in the group's overall ranking. But rather than causing chocolate to win by a landslide, this actually triggers the vote counting to proceed in a very different way. This time it's strawberry, with only four top place votes, that ends up getting eliminated. After the votes are reassigned, we see that vanilla ends up winning with nine of the 17 votes. So even though their top choice has only gotten better, this group has reacted by rejecting that option, leaving us with the disconcerting impression that chocolate has lost this election because it received too many votes. Economists call this outcome a failure of monotonicity, and it's an example of how, even though every individual in the group has acted rationally, the group as a whole has done something that looks insane. We call these voting paradoxes. Each of them shows a way in which group decision-making differs from individual decision-making. It might be imagined that these are technical problems that could be ironed out with a sufficiently good voting system. But in the early 1950s, the economist Kenneth Arrow showed that, given certain assumptions, paradoxes such as these are unavoidable. That is, mathematically speaking, there does not exist a method of converting individual preferences into a single group preference that doesn't occasionally suffer from a known voting paradox. When we cast a vote, we help choose an ice cream flavor. When we select a voting method, we are effectively choosing from a menu of voting paradoxes. This insight about the limitations of group decision-making is known as Arrow's impossibility theorem. Kenneth Arrow later won the Nobel Prize in economics for this result, which set the stage for modern social choice theory, the mathematical study of how groups make decisions.